the Polyglot Gathering is brought to you by italki. Become fluent in any language. Okay, I think we're going to start. Everybody's here? Okay, so welcome. Thank you for being here. Um, I'm very happy, very excited to talk about a language that's very dear to me because it's one of the most fascinating languages that I came across. And um, yeah, welcome. Tavin Saste Taibachtale. May you be healthy and lucky, full of luck. And um, I'm going to present uh, a few facts about the language of the Roma. I think you all know what Roma are, I hope. Yeah. Um, and I'm the aim of this presentation is basically to arouse some interest in this beautiful language. And maybe um, I thought, you know, this time we don't have a sticker for Romani for our badges. Maybe next year we're going to have a sticker for that. Yeah, and have a few people chatting in Romani. It would be very nice. Okay? So, um, Romani is very interesting because there are a lot of myths about it. I call it the hidden gem of uh, European languages. It's not a European language, actually. Its source is Indian, and um, there are a lot of things people say about Romani which are either true or not. We're going to find out. First of all, I'd like to give you some facts about uh, Romani. Um, it is a purely international language. And I, you know, I study languages for a European perspective, rather exotic languages such as Arabic or Hindi, and I was always amazed uh, by um, the reaction of people when I speak their language. It's a different thing whether you speak French or Hindi. You know, when you speak as a non-Indian, you speak Hindi to an Indian, you'd be very happy that you made the effort of learning his or her language. And with Romani, it's the same thing. With Romani, Romani it's even more. Sometimes you would find people who say, oh, you're a Rom, otherwise you cannot be a speaker of this language. And this is a language you find all over <coughs> Europe. You find it in North and South America. You find it in Australia. So you would find speakers all over the place. And wherever you meet them and speak in their language, you would have a very, very intimate contact. So that's one of the beauties of this language, unlike any other language. <clears throat> I cannot tell you how many speakers there are because it's very difficult to say. There are somewhere in between three and five million speakers. It's not a standardized language, so there are a lot of dialects. So, you know, it's very hard to say what is standard Romani. Um, why three to five million? Well, because the numbers that we have, they are all based on, on census, you know, estimates from countries, many Roma would not declare themselves as Ro uh, Romani speakers or even Roma. So it's very difficult to tell. But I can assure you, you find many, many, many Roma and many Romani speakers throughout Europe. And, um, you know, after we finish the speech, try some sentences and you will find out what I mean, okay? <clears throat> um, yeah, I just give you a number of estimates like Obviously, Romania, Bulgaria, Russia, Serbia, other countries where you have a lot of Roma now due to migration within Europe. Obviously, you would find Romanian, Bulgarian, Roma living in Germany, Austria, and other places, France. Um, it is an official minority language in many, many countries of the EU, including Austria, including Germany in some parts including uh, countries such as Macedonia, for instance, Serbia. It is an official language of the uh, Council of Europe. Uh, I said it's not a standardized form, so it's always very difficult to how could it be an official language if it's not standardized. We're going to talk about this. There are a lot of dialects, and some of the dialects are, in a way, more or less standardized. Then this is just a map showing you as a set due to uh, migration it's very tough to say you know here you'd see romania <coughs> bulgaria and turkey with the largest uh, roma population in, in europe however many many romanian bulgarian roma now live somewhere else so it's you know it's not that easy to say um first of all just to give you an introduction into it um what does it sound like has any one of you besides felix ever experienced 
Romani as a language. Yeah. Okay. So, um, are there any Czech or Slovak here? Okay. So I'm gonna I'm gonna make you listen to something that I'm sure um, people from, especially from the Czech Republic and from Slovakia, will know. Just let's see if the speakers work. Try to just listen to it, to the song, and read it. You have the Romani and the English translation. How did you like it? How did it, how did it sound? Amazing. Like it? Yeah. yeah? Yes. It's a nice, it's a beautiful language. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's very melodic. Can I ask a question? It seems like it has a lot of cases though, because you know, it looks like you have that. We gonna, we gonna come, we gonna come to this too. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now again. How did Martin do this? Okay, um, yeah, we definitely got to talk about grammar. Anyone who knows Hindi will recognize instantly, certainly the first line. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, did you actually, did you know the song from, from the Czech Republic? It's a big hit, so you obviously don't <laughs> live in the Czech Republic these days. You don't. Sorry? I, I heard that people are learning the song by heart. Young Bandic, he's a very famous singer now of the Czech Republic. You haven't heard of this? No. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. Um, let's go into history, first of all. Um, as I said, there always have been myths about Romani. So if you look at the um, terms for the Roma that are considered, uh, you know, pejorative nowadays, like gypsies or gitanos. These words obviously come from Egypt. I mean, it meant the Egyptians, gypsies, gitanos, the same thing, Egipto. Yeah? So, um, throughout many, many, many centuries, the Roma themselves believed that they actually came from India. And it was a German linguist called Johann Christian Christoph Rüdiger, you have to say that 10 times, very fast, <laughs> who um, studied at the University of Leiden. And uh, he was in touch with uh, Roma in the place where he lived. And he met scholars for Sanskrit in Leiden. And he realized that there were a couple of words that he learned from Roma living in his area that he recognized. So he came up with the, uh, the assumption that actually Romani is an Indian language in its source, okay? So, what's interesting is that 
Today, obviously, yes, we know that the Roma must have come from India, but it was through linguistic research that we, that we found out. And one of the beauties of Romani for me, besides the fact that it's, you know, uh, very, very beautiful and it's so nice to talk to people because they're, uh, of their reaction, is that it actually is a, um, an archaeological uh, research. When you start learning the language and you start learning about the loan words and where they come from, you could figure out a lot what happened to the Roma throughout their trip from India to Europe, okay? So, <clears throat> it's very difficult to say. We Now we know that there's, there definitely was not one group. We don't, you know, we don't want to talk about why they left India and, um, you know, what happened, must have happened in India. This is not the subject of this uh, speech, obviously. <clears throat> we know um, that there are documents from the Sassanid Empire, which is present-day Persia, uh, documents from the uh, Byzantine Empire, which is present-day uh, present Anatolia and um, uh, Turkey, like, you know, Greece, and documents from the South Balkans, stretching all the way up to the 7th century. So, in here, this is India, this is Pakistan, Afghanistan, this is Persia, Iran, uh, present-day Turkey, and um, yeah, i just give you some of the times here. It says 9 till 11 AD. Uh, you know, it's very, it's very difficult to say. It doesn't really matter for us now, okay? Um, starting from the 19th century, there was linguistic evaluation, and throughout the years, people realized that, yes, indeed, it is an Indian language, okay? But it was as late as, as you know, 18th century that it all started. Okay, this is this is a bit of a complex map. Doesn't really matter much, but just to show you that there has been a lot of, you know, movement of Roma throughout the ages within Europe. Okay, now we get to the core. How can you trace a language? How can you do that? Obviously, first of all, if you look at the words they're using. So, when we speak of Romani nowadays from a linguistic point of view, we always divide the so-called origins and the new loan words. New loan words doesn't mean um, English loan words like, you know, blogger or internet. No, new loan words might be quite old as well, but they're not as old as the basis, okay? So, within the origins, we have two groups. The first ones are the so-called Indo-Aryan origin. So, I don't know, any one of you speak Indian languages here? Definitely yes, Hindi, yeah? So, just look at these words. Ame, Bakri, Baro, Del, Yag, Ker, Pai, Sumnakai, Tulo. Yeah, it will remind you of Indian languages, I suppose. Yeah. Okay, so <clears throat> afterwards, I showed you on the map. So they moved out of India into what was Persian speaking at that time. So you would find a lot of Persian words in here. Okay, Bacht, for example, Lak. Yeah. When you look at the Persian learn loan words, is there anything puzzling you? Anyone speak Persian? Who speaks Persian? I, I'm puzzled by mole. Mole? Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm not talking about uh, a word, but what do you miss here? If you look at the Persian words, what do you miss? If you look at present-day Persian, what is, what is the biggest Arabic? There are no Arabic loan words in here, okay? This is all purely Persian. What does it show us if it's pure? So they must have crossed present-day Persia either before Islam arrived or at least at a time where Arabic was not as deeply rooted in the day-to-day -day language, okay? Isn't that fantastic? So you kind of trace 
through a language. It's like archaeology, just by looking at the words they're using. Second one, Armenian. Anyone speaking Armeni Armenian? <coughs> Speaks Armenian a little bit? Yeah, okay. So, why Armenian? Anything puzzling you here? I mean, if you look at India, Pakistan, Persia, and then, not only it's Turkey, right? Why is it Armenian? Because it was before, uh, when the Armenian people uh, were, uh, before exactly. 1905. <laughs> no, 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 no. Even, no, no, no. I, I don't want to talk about this. No, I, <laughs> even much, much before that. Must have happened at a time before. There's a second microphone. Hello. The little red button. Hello. Yeah. I can turn it on. No, yes. Okay, so Armenian, it was before the Turks arrived. You know, you know that the Turks, they came from Central Asia. So by the time they settled in, in Turkey, uh, or before that, Armenian was the main language being spoken there. Okay, that's the reason why you find Armenian. And then the, the third one is Greek. Okay, so why Greek? Because Greek was the dominant language in what is present day, you know, Western Turkey and obviously in Greece. All right, so and now let's go to the new loan words. After they arrived in Greece, they must have spent their several centuries before they moved onwards. Okay, so depending on um, the dialect, you would find loan words of either Romance, Slavic, Germanic languages, you know, Hungarian. And um, I, I'd like to read out some of these words, and I want you to pay proper attention. And then we go back to the to the slide before, and then I'm going to read out a few words, and then I want you to um, see if there's something you could figure out. Okay, so let's let's go to društvo, slobodia, stanica, feliastra, gindo, lumia, caito, farba, flasha, okay, cialado, emeleto, piresho. Get back to this, and here you would have uh, angustri, corro. Humer, Dudum, Kurko. Anything you realize? Can you listen to this? Stress. Stress? Uh huh. Okay. The stress. Words from the first group, which is the origins, they always have the stress on the final syllable. New loan words never have the stress on the final syllable, okay? If you ask me why, I don't know, but it's the way it is. So it is very, very easy to figure out when you hear a new word, whether it is an original word or a new loan word, even though you might not speak Hungarian, for instance, and realize that it's actually of Hungarian <coughs> origin, okay? I have one question, if I may, about one of the loan word because I noticed in the song a word for which is the same parenthesis in Polish and I will for me but and in the song I think it's also corresponded to but is it a loan word or is it just a coincidence? It is a loan word. It is a loan word. Yeah. Okay. Um, Chris, I, I think the, the reason is simply the stress in the original languages because Armenian and Persian have the stress on the last syllable and and these languages, uh, for example, Hungarian has it on the first syllable, so maybe that's the reason for it. No, no, it's not, it's not necessarily the reason. I mean, there are certain words that you would have from German, for instance, that have the stress on the last syllable or others, and you would still have um, the, the stress on the first. It's really, it's, 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 I don't know, maybe it's magic. No, um, <laughs> it, 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 you know, it's the, the um, uh, Romania doesn't uh, always maintain the stress of the original word. 
So some of the words, like the Slava uh, Slavonic words, you would find um, in dialects that are spoken in mainly German or, or even uh, Hungarian-speaking areas, and you would still find a lot of Slavonic loan words because they're older than the Romance words, you know, because um, languages like, you know, Old Slavic were spoken in, in the areas where they lived initially, so they took a lot of Slavonic loan words, even though, you know, Ten generations later, they might live in Finland, for instance. So it's you know it has changed it has changed quite uh, extensively ever since. But just again, um, this is one of the interesting things about this. So I'm going to give you a sentence where you would find. Um, can, is it a, an important question to this thing or? Uh, just uh, one addition to that uh, name of the gypsy, that uh, Egyptian, uh, which is many of. Uh, there is a group uh, in Macedonia who say we are Egyptian, uh, we are not Roma. Uh, there is a theory that when they stayed in Greece, a large group of them uh, stayed on Cyprus, <coughs> the island of Cyprus, which was at that time called uh, Small Egypt. So yeah. and then they had a, a little kingdom kind of state there, and from there they know themselves Egyptians because they are from strong, small yeah. I, you know, I can I can assure you there there are conferences that last two weeks and people are just talking about this issue all the time. We don't have the time for that. But yes, I agree with you. You know, there's so many theories and so many. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Okay. So here you see an interesting sentence, which combines all the origins. But rakle avile stress on the last syllable. Khurde Persian. Kocakenza, Tai, Krafinenza, Ande, Krchma, Le, Podoski. Okay, I don't know if you know if you speak Hindi or Persian, Armenian, Greek, you would definitely find some words in here that you know. Yeah? A Romanian, Podo, yeah? Podoski. Okay, um, what's interesting about this is that there, uh, this language, Romani, does not exist without a contact language. So, Roma are always bilingual, at least. Okay, so you would not find anyone who only speaks Romani. I doubt that, that there have ever been Roma just, you know, obviously there are people that speak much better Romani than maybe Hungarian or Serbian or wherever they live, that might be. But they would always speak the other language. And depending on the place where they live, they absorb words from that contact language or from different contact languages. Yeah? However, you would still have the origins of Persian, Greek, uh, Armenian, offspring, and also others, because imagine if a group moved through places in the southern Balkans and finally settled in, um, say, Austria, they would still have a lot of Slavic, a lot of uh, Romanian, a lot of Hungarian loan words maybe, and that at a certain point they would start to absorb words from German, okay? Um, yeah, it's hard to say how, um, how many loan words you would normally find in a, in a, in a standard uh, Romani, you know, uh, dialect. Um, it can be anything up to 50 to 75. Uh, there's a lot of code switching, you know, sometimes you would have people speaking two languages at the same time, just switching between, in between the two. <clears throat> and just to give you numbers, we know that there are 700 roots of Indo-Aryan origin. You would have about 100 from Iranian, which is Persian, and some Western Persian uh, languages as well. <clears throat> you would have at least 20 from Armenian and up to 250 from Greek. Okay. However, none of these exist in one single dialect. Okay. So it's quite difficult to to say how my how many loan words are there and how uh, specific um, dialect is said. Okay. Just to give you, we're gonna do a little bit the same thing tomorrow, Tim, yeah. the other languages we talk about. <coughs> um, Indian roots, I'm very interested in Indian languages, as some of you might know. So um, just to show you how some of the words have evolved from Sanskrit, 
to Romani. Um, they have not evolved, obviously, through the stage of Hindi. It's just I give you Hindi as, you know, uh, a, way, a way to, to compare. Um, so what's interesting is that in, in um, modern or new Indo-Aryan language, uh, for example, ST most of the time became T or an aspirated T, okay? Whereas in Romani it still is ST. So you would have hasta, in Hindi it's hard, and in uh, Romani it's vast, okay? And then, yeah, you, you could see some of, you know, if you, um, if you look at brater, bhai, and pral, you know? So in Romani it sounds closer to uh, Sanskrit still than it does to, uh, to Hindi. Um, yeah, some, you know, for example, the ksh uh, of uh, Sanskrit uh, became a, an aspirated k in, in Romani, as it also uh, did in, in Hindi. So this is a normal uh, evolution which, uh, where we could also say, okay, the, the Roma must have left at a certain point when this evolution in a spoken form of Sanskrit or Prakrit or whatever you want to call it uh, already had happened, all right? So you would have the akshi, uh, it's down here, yeah? The I in Sanskrit would become a Romani yak, okay? J uh, is always pronounced as in German, so it's yak, it's not a jak, yeah? So the big myth, um, I met people who studied, um, who studied Sanskrit or Hindi and who told me, oh, no problem, whenever I meet Roma, I can just understand any, anything they say, you know, no problem. And of course, you know, I don't know, I, I don't think it works. But um, now the question is, would it be possible if you speak, say, Romani, could you speak to a Hindi-speaking person or vice versa? Well, only... Um, on a very simplified basis and only obviously once you know the etymo uh, etymological root of, of, the lang of the words that you're using. Now, most Roma, they don't, you know, they don't care as we, we never think about is this Latin or is it ancient Greek, the word that we're just using or where does it come from? So obviously in, in Romani it's the same thing, you know, nobody thinks about the words, but if, you know, if you're open for this and if you're interested in this, you could make up sentences like mire bal hin kale, tire bal nai kale. The Hindi speakers, would you understand that? What does it mean? My, my hair is black. Exactly. My hair is black. Your hair is not black. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> won't, won't make you buy beer, right? <laughs> <laughs> and kon um, hin kere, what could that be? Kon, kon hin kere, yeah. I mean, um, who is kon is kon, kon hin is kere, at home, yeah? Ker, yeah? So it means who is at home. But you see, it's not that easy, you know. You could try to find out, but... Kon uh, ayas, who came, miri bari pen ai. I think that's easier. What could that be? My brother came. My big sister, my elderly sister, my older sister came. Okay, but you know that that's about what you can say, not much more than that. Okay. So um, yeah, if you. There has been a lot of research of tracing where the Roma came from, which part of India, and that also, uh, if you if you look at some of the words they use, you could more or less try to to you know uh, position them somewhere in in definitely in Western India. It's not Eastern India, and it must be somewhere between Rajasthan and the present day Punjab. But even there, it's difficult. For example, you would have word forms such as. Um, Kerdo, which is done, and if you say I did, it would be depending on the on the dialect. It would be kerdem or kerdiom. So <coughs> you would have what we call the uh, enclitic pronouns, which are attached 
as markers to the world. So this is something that normally doesn't happen in um, uh, like new Indo-Aryan languages. Only in Marathi you would have that partly, okay? Uh, but you have it in in uh, Dardic languages. You have it in Kashmiri. So you know that kind of destroys the assumption that yeah they must have been from this particular part of Rajasthan. So it's you know it's very difficult. And then again. It definitely was not one group that set off at some time. It was throughout the ages that several groups moved westwards, and so it's it's very difficult. And I don't think it's really important to to trace the exact place where they come from. Okay, it's my personal opinion. So um, let's look at the dialects because uh, obviously whenever you want to learn Romani, you at some point have to decide which is the dialect that I'm going for, you know. Um, <clears throat> that again is a very, it's a very complex uh, issue. You, um, you could say that there are two major groups in uh, the, you know, dialect spectrum of Romani. Um, it's a historic fact that many, many of the Roma, once they left um, Greece, uh, became slaves in what is present-day Wallachia, which is uh, Romania and parts of uh, Moldova. So, and they lived there throughout, you know, many, many centuries. So their language became very influenced by um, Romanian. But they were secluded, they were living in an area where they did not have much influence with other Roma. Yeah? So this is one of the major groups which is called Vlach, that's the X, like in the Cyrillic, Russian, yeah, Vlach. And then you would have the, the so-called non-Vlach, which are, um, you know, other groups that moved north and westwards. And you have different groups. You have uh, something um, like uh, a Balkanic group in the south with different <coughs> dialects again. Um, you would have northeastern, which is Russian. You would have central and you have a northern or northwestern group, so it's quite complex. Um, just to give you a comparison of uh, some of the, the dialects, just to show you how they sound or what some of the changes are, um, I just randomly took a sentence which is, why is there war in the world? And now if you look at three different groups from the Vlach, group, you would have soske, soske means for what, it means why, si, or here in this case you would have the Romanian e, like a schwa sound, s, marimos, and lumia. So <clears throat> marimos comes from the word marel, marel from Hindi you know that means to beat, okay, so it's mar, the uh, root, and then you would have the imos, which definitely is a Greek ending, marimos, so it became war, you know, the thing where you battle. Ande, in, and lumia is the Romanian word for the world. So <coughs> look at the three, look how they change. Look at the uh, third one, for example, you would have instead of uh, marimos, you would have maripe, you know, so you have. Uh, you know, the um, ending for, for a noun, you would have two possibilities, which is either imos, so it's ipe, yeah? so marimos, maripe. And then here, instead of saying lumia, you could say that depends on the group, like lumia would, would be of a group that has um, lived in Romania throughout some time and others that moved maybe westwards, like in Bosnia, for instance you would have uh, the word sveto, which of course is of Slavonic uh, origin, okay? And then look at the non-Vlach. <coughs> First one, Arli, is a group uh, in the southern Balkans, in Macedonia, Kosovo, uh, parts of uh, southern Serbia. So you would have Soske, Isi, instead of Si, Isi, Maripe, again the same as, as above, An Edunia, Dunia, Dunia, Turkish, so it's a Turkish loan word here. Okay, and then Sueto again. Yeah. Then um, the next one is East East Slovak, 
uh, here it's just instead of Mari Pe, it becomes Mari Ben. So, you know, it's a B instead of a P, and then you would have Svetos instead of Sveto, for instance. Third one is the Bungland Roma, which have uh, been influenced by Hungarian. Bungland is the southeastern part of Austria, which uh, until 1921, if I'm not mistaken, was part of Hungary. So, <clears throat> here instead of uh, Mari Pe, Mari Ben, Mari Mos, you would have Habori which is a Hungarian word, uh, and then Vilago for the world, which also, you know, obviously is Hungarian. How do you know, for example, Dunya is Turkish when it runs from Turkey through the Hindi, Nepali, Indonesian, Thai? You know? No, it's, you know, it's Turkish in, in Romani because it came through the Ottoman um, occupation of the Balkans. So they, they took, yes, I'm, yes, of course, I mean, but Turkish in the sense of, uh, before I said there are no Arabic loan words, and um, there are Arabic loan words nowadays, but this is due to the presence of the Ottomans and like the Turks in the, in the south, uh, southern Balkans, but not um, due to the fact that they crossed Turkey as a Turkish speaking country. Okay, so Dunya here as a Turkish loan word because it was taken from the, the Turks, there were no Arabs in the Balkans, that's just, you know, but yes, of course, if you look at the etymology and then it could be. <clears throat> and then um, the uh, last one is the Sintitikes, spoken by the Sinti. Sinti is a group of um, uh, Roma who moved uh, quite quickly to Central and Western Europe, so their language has been largely influenced by German. You would find Sinti all over Northern Europe as well. You would, have, uh, you would find in Finland, uh, you would find uh, speakers of Romani who speak a similar dialect. Yeah. So here, instead of um, Maripen, Marimos, uh, you would have Kurepen, or you would have Krigo, and then the world becomes Velto, Ano Velto, okay? Here again, um, I'm Austrian, so in, in Austria, uh, Romani is a minority language, so uh, just look at some of the words and just compare them. So you would have five five groups, three of them, the Sinti, the Bogenland Roma and the Lovara, the last ones, are um, autochton Austrian groups, whereas all autochton means that they have been living in Austria for at least five generations, I think, uh, whereas Arli and Kelderas are, um, you know, either um, the Kalderaj came in the 70s from former Yugoslavia. Ali speakers are coming, even at that time they came, but now a lot of Ali speakers are coming from Kosovo, for instance. So, yeah, just look at some of the words, like the first one, the world, like we said, Ovelto, then Bunglat, Ovilago, Eduna, Dunya, uh, Elumia, Iluma, Lovara. <coughs> the dialect that I'm most familiar with is the dialect of the Lovara, the Lovara were the uh, former horse traders in Hungary, or in Hungarian-speaking areas of Romania and uh, Slovakia. So <coughs> um, their language is a Vlach, it is a Vlach dialect, but it has been influenced by Hungarian quite a bit. Yeah. Is that interesting? You find it interesting? <laughs> okay, so um, if you want to learn now which dialect sh should you choose? Obviously, um, the three major uh, questions is, first of all, your personal motivation. Mm -hmm. You know, if, you, if you're interested in, in, a, in a specific group uh, or geographic reasons because you live in a certain place, if you live in, um, say, if you live in um, Slovakia, maybe you should go for East Slovak or you should go for a central uh, a dialect because that's the one you could most probably use the most. Um, and contact language. I mean, this is, this is so great if you speak Hungarian and uh, uh, it's really tough to find another language that uh, has anything in common with Hungarian. Try Romani. You would find a dialect <laughs> where, you know, you can use your, your Hungarian. So, you know, it was not in vain. <laughs> <laughs> and um, if, if in doubt, uh, I would suggest you go for a Vlach dialect rather than a non-Vlach dialect. Why? Because Vlach and especially Kelderash, Kelderash um, were the, uh, from Romania, the former tin makers, Kelderara. So 
um, their dialects somewhat became a bit of a standardized form, like for instance the Council of Europe, whenever they translate texts, they would translate it into, into uh, Kaldarash. So Kaldarash, uh, you find quite a bit of, of material, and um, that would be a good thing to start with. Or Novara, of course, is similar. Um, this, is, this is just to show you that even though we speak of a dialect group, there's still so many different uh, particular groups within one of, of the dialect, um, you know, meta groups, that it's still always, even though you speak Kaldarash, if you speak Kaldarash uh, like they speak it in, in um, say, uh, Transylvania, it doesn't mean that you understand uh, easily everything people, Kaldarash speakers from Serbia say. So, you know, but by the time, and you know, you're all polyglots, you speak several languages, you would have this sense for, oh, okay, this is Slavonic, so yes, this person comes from Serbia, so probably I use Sveto instead of you know, Mila. This is a great thing. I mean, this is what we are good at and where we can play with. Okay, so phonetics. Don't want to talk about this too much now. Here again, you could you could have a chart for each and every dialect. Obviously, uh, what's important is that uh, Romani has the distinction between between aspirated and non-aspirated, as Indian languages do. So that's important. Um, this is a chart for the Lovara dialect. Um, one thing, I don't know if you see that, but one thing that's important here is there are two R's. This one is not the one that it's pronounced like in Czech, not at all. It is just a R, okay? And the other one is a R. Yeah? So um, in Lovara you don't have this distinction, but in Kandarash you would have it. Yeah? So, so, which is the difference, sorry? R, R, the... Actually, you're going to talk about this here, yeah? Just, just a second. Uh -huh. Okay, here you have the vowels. So, depending on the dialect, whether it's non-vlach or vlach, you would have a few words that sound differently. For instance, the aspirated ch, yeah? Chavo, the boy, becomes shavo in vlach, okay? And then some of the rolled Romani, Romani chip becomes becomes Romani chip. So it's a R, yeah? The way the Parisians speak. Okay? So, you know, just just to show you a few things. Um, j, for instance, the J becomes J. So Vlach sometimes sounds a bit softer in a way. Yeah. But what's really important is that they're aspirated sounds. Yeah. Okay, then let's speak a little... Uh, what the, does the phrase mean? Oh, sorry. O tiro chavo janel mishto i romani chi. The, uh, your boy or your, yeah, your son uh, speaks well um, Romani. Romani. Chip, chip is the tongue, jibha in, in uh, Hindi, um, and it means language. It's the same, you know, language and tongue. And in Vlach it would sound O tiro, shavo, janel mishto e Romani chip. Okay? Structure and morphology. Two genders. Um, normally the words ending in O are masculine, the ones ending in E are uh, feminine. So, oraklo erakli is the boy, normally the non-gypsy boy. Oraklo erakli. Oker e pen. So here we'd say, uh, you would see uh, um, an article. Obviously Indian languages, Northern Indian languages don't have articles. Uh, this must have evolved from what would you suggest, which language? If you look at O and E or O and E? Greek. Greek? Yes, definitely. Okay, so O is the masculine um, article. Some of the some of the words that don't end in O and, uh, and E you have to learn unless you know it because the biological gender determines the uh, 
grammar. Okay, so it's a pen, pen is the sister, or ker is the house. Yeah? Um, you have singular and plural, so um, the O becomes an E, so it's e rakle. The E, uh, the I becomes an Ia for the feminine, er raklia, and so on. Okay? Adjectives, uh, adjectives agree in gender number, o baro raklo. E bare rakle, which would be plural, and then the feminine would be e bari rakli. Okay, I'm get, you know, not going to go through all of this, just to show you know it's pretty straightforward. Um, you have two cases, as in Hindi or as in other uh, northern uh, new Indo-Aryan languages. So uh, you know, in Sanskrit, you had up to eight cases. Here, all of this is lost, so you just have a nominative case and you have an oblique case. And then, depending on what you add to the oblique case, you would uh, form genitive, dative, uh, ablative, locative, instrumental. And there's also a vocative. Uh, um, words works so, have. Uh, excuse me, for, yes. for the cases, I don't understand. Uh, you say there, is, there are all, only two. But then, uh, apparently, there are many. <laughs> I don't understand. So, <clears throat> oraklo uh -huh. becomes, this is a direct case, it becomes in the oblique, rakles, uh -huh. which is the same as accusative. Okay? And then, you just add the genitive part the particle, ki, for instance, ko, for dative, okay. tar, yeah, for ablative, locative. So, te. okay, so, so it's a philosophical question if you consider them cases yes, or yes. Uh, it's just positions. From, from a learner's point of view, I, you know, I'm trying okay. to sell you this language. Ah, yes. <laughs> I want to make it as easy as possible. So that's the reason. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'll buy it. I'll buy it. <laughs> um, words have pre uh, present and past roots, so you could say make it of. Me we had in the in the uh, movie we, we had me tut ujarav. So again, you would see the av ending, which is uh, present uh, first person singular. Okay, and um, some ir uh, irregularities like me jav, I go, but me gelem or me gelem, depending on the dialect. Again, I went. Tim. <coughs> You have accusative with oblique, but like in Nepali or Hindi, the nominative case in a sense is still be in the oblique case. Is that the same or is it completely different? Um, like you do past tense, like um, um, I mean, the, the, the difference is that in Hindi, for instance, you would not have an accusative in its in its uh, original sense of the word. You know, you would not say if I, if you say I saw the boy, the boy would not, the boy's word would not change. Whereas in in, in Romanes it changes. So this is again an influence from from other European languages. Okay. Okay, I have to be quick now. Um, how it actually works? Just look at some of these sentences. Just look at how they work. It's you know, the, the translation is word by word. So just, you know, to give you a certain idea how, how this, this works, I, uh, really, I can read it for you. Kaisio puro rom, where is the old rom? Ipuri romnisi anoker. Moto mange variso patumaro traio kate. Kamafte vorbi tie da desa. Numa sigo taia kana. Okay, like in the dialect I, I speak, I would say Aba sigo taya kanik instead of Numa. Numa is but Hungarian, like uh, Romanian, sorry. Uh, sigo sounds Romanian as well, right? Yeah. Okay. Now, um, this is for you to learn the numbers from 1 to uh, 50. Um, again, remember your, your Hindi and remember your Greek. So, yek dui trin star 
Πάνσ, Σοφ, 7, 8, 9, Dash. What I mean, what happened to seven, eight, and nine? Didn't they have that on their way? Why do they have ten? I mean, ten is again Indo-Aryan, and and you know, it's 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 strange. Nobody knows why why Efta Ochtoin Inya is Greek, and all the other uh, the others are are, are Indo-Aryan. You know, quite funny. Um, look at the days of the week. Well, um, what's easy again? Another thing to sell the language. If the numbers are much easier than in Hindi. You know, in Hindi, it's a real nightmare to learn to learn all the, the numbers up to our Nepali the same. This is far easier. Like um, you know, Trianda would be thirty. This is the only irregularity you have to learn, and all the others is like Shtar Vardesh, which is four times ten, which is forty, or Panch Vardesh, fifty. So it's really easy. Yeah. Um, look at the um, days of the week. Some of them again are Greek, some of them are Romanian or Slavonic, depending on the dialect. But you have Kurko, you have Tetragi, you have Parashtui and Savato, which is of Greek origin. Okay. So they have double names. In some cases, it's, it's not double. It's just depending, you know, it, on the like Vlach, a Vlach group okay, would okay, use okay, okay. Luya, yeah, yeah, which okay. would Marzi, because it's Romanian. Like others, if you, you know, Panedelniko, of course, is, you know, Slavonic, depending on the, on the contact language. Okay, then Roma uh, Romanian action, just a few uh, sentences you have to remember. And then, please, you will find Ro Roma, as I said, everywhere in Europe. Just try it, just talk to them. Even though you know just one word, it's gonna be a mind-blowing experience. Okay, so, Tavis Sasto, Taibachtalo, we learned that before, we had Tales Haste Taibachtale, which is the plural. Tales Sasto Taibachtalo, you would say to a man, you know, may you be healthy and may you have luck or may you be lucky, you know, which is the normal, you know, way of saying hello. Or to, to a woman, you would say Tales Sasti Taibachtali, okay? Sarsan means how are you? The answer would be Mishto sim aitu, I'm fine, and you? And then this is, this is again, this is something I, I really love. Chav choi lo. Chav choi lo means I eat your heart. It means, you know, sorry, excuse me. Chav choi lo. Penta mange. Penta mange, tell me, please tell me. Okay? Chav choi lo. Or the next one is chumidav. We have that in the song. Chumidav choi lo. I kiss your heart. Mm. Isn't that poetic? Great, huh? Chumidav choi lo sarbushos. What are you called? What is your name? Okay. And then mebushuvav Daniel. Yeah. Taitu and you. Yeah. Then sias means cheers. Tetrain but bersh. May you live many years. Bersh. I think it's easy from Hindi. Yeah. Tetraim but bersh. Ach devlesa, may you uh, remain with uh, God. And ja devlesa, may you go with God, which is the way of saying goodbye. And then some more rom, rom nisan. This is something that you're going to be asked when you speak a word in Romani because it's the question of are you a rom or are you a romni? Yeah? Okay. Um, look at this. And uh, I think that was. All. Then, you know, this is just some material. If you want to take some pictures, this is the material to continue learning. Um, take a picture, or if you want to have the, the PowerPoint presentation, I can send it to you. Just give me your email address. Uh, the two major universities in Europe working on this issue in this field are the uh, University of Graz in Austria and the University of Manchester. Okay. Who's that author, Daniel Constant? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Nice to meet you. Thank you all. <laughs> and, and just the last thing to wish you Tetrain Bud, Tai Nishto, Tumare, Chavinza, Tai Sa, Nepotanza. May you all live long together with your children and grandchildren. Oh. Oh.